Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired Microsoft Operating Systems Engineer from the MS-DOS Windows 95 days, and I'm here today to do a little Windows retro coding. Shake the dust off your C compiler, kids. We're going to get down to the bare metal today. Watch me write an old school Hello Windows app without Visual Studio, IntelliSense, or any other modern assists, and I'll be doing it live in a text editor without a net. We'll do it live! Okay. A few years ago, there was a movie wherein America suddenly needed its old school test pilot astronauts back, but since America had apparently been caught slacking, none had been trained up, and so they rounded up all the old originals from the 1960s to come back out of retirement and show them all how it's done. Every now and then, I have a dream like that about programming. I imagine that there's some dire national emergency that can only be solved by the best and brightest operating systems programmers, only to discover that everyone's now a JavaScript programmer writing for Node.js frameworks. And that's normally when I wake up, only to discover there's no emergency, no need for all those handy coding skills I accumulated back in the 80s and 90s. But today, we're going to put them to use anyway, writing Hello World for Windows with no frameworks, helpers, libraries, or scripts. We're going retro coding from scratch with no Visual Studio allowed. We'll edit in a plain text editor and build it on the command line so that today you can see how the sausage is actually made. It'll be Hello World written to the lowest level Windows APIs. I bet there are a lot of folks who call themselves Windows programmers who, if they had to write an actual Hello World program for Windows, just couldn't do it without IntelliSense, frameworks, class libraries, two web browsers, and a Docker container. So today, we're going to get raw and do it live. We're going to do the most very basic things. Register a window class, create a window of that class, paint Hello World within it, and pump the message loop. Rather than skim past these essential details as though they're mere boilerplate, however, we'll delve into them in such a way that you'll actually understand them. I won't hand wave over the details. I'll actually explain them so you know what's going on at each and every step along the way. I'll explain why you have to register a window class at all, and what the window proc is, and why it's so important, and so on. You probably won't go on to write a lot of code this way. You absolutely still could do so, and it'd be about the smallest, fastest, lightest Windows program you could conceivably write, but even though that's how we did it all day long in the 90s, it's a little verbose to work this way in pure C. I've even omitted the air checking on the loading of hard-coded resources in the name of brevity and clarity. The difference is, I hope, that you'll fully understand each of the lines of code, or most of them anyway. No more mysteries, no more man behind the curtain, no more wondering what the heck the difference is between a WPRAM and an LPRAM. All will be revealed. I also won't just let some massive IDE crank out a piece of bloatware that's linked to a few dozen megabytes of libraries and frameworks that we don't really need. As I indicated, not only will our app be concise on the page, but it should also fit in your head. It should wind up somewhere in the neighborhood of 100k, no more, and if we could likely shed half of that if I got fancy by pruning the C++ runtimes, but that's optimization for another day. Modern IDEs tend to hide much of the gore associated with the build process behind their fancy colored windows, but not today. Because as much as I'm a big fan of Visual Studio, we won't be coding in it for this project. Just a plain old text editor and a command prompt. I want you to really get a sense for the process end to end. To start a new project, I'm going to allow one concession to modern methods, and that's to reuse an old VC project make file to create my completely empty Windows project. I just mean the empty project file, no code. That will give me the two dozen or so command line switches that I need to pass to the compiler rather than figure them all out by myself from scratch, which would take an entire episode and be fairly mind-numbing if I tried to do it. In terms of files, there are three types of files that will go into making our program. Source code files, header files, and resource files. The resource file is a special text file format where we include the English text and the links to art and images that might be changed from region to region and language to language. By separating text and images from the code, you make localization for other places and languages much easier. Refreshingly, our project is so simple that we will only have a single C++ file, a single RC resource file, and a couple of .h header files that include the definitions needed for the C++ file to refer over to the resources. We then need to provide two small images to be used as the large and small icons, respectively. But that's it. That's all you need for a complete Windows application. So let's bust out the editor and get busy. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. I wanted to pick a really basic editor, but Notepad doesn't fill them all that well. Instead, I opted to use the character mode editor called Nano directly in the command window. It's actually a Linux app running under the WSL2 subsystem, so you know it's not doing me any automated favors on the Windows code side. Let's just say there's no IntelliSense, but it's big and it's bold and it's high contrast and it's easy to read, so it's my editor of choice for today. Our first step will be to put in a generic simple comment and then include the essential Windows header files that we need to compile with. The 
the Win32 lean and mean symbol that I'm defining here limits the number of headers that are in turn included by Windows.h, which as you might have guessed is the main system include file. For example, we don't need WinSock and Crypto, so lean and mean works for our case. The whole point was to include fewer headers for a faster build, it won't make your code any smaller. All that said, I bet this compiles in about a second when we're done, so you're not saving yourself all that much either way these days. Finally, we include the file at resource.h, which is shared between the C compiler and the resource compiler. This allows us to define a menu ID like IDM exit and then both the C compiler and the resource compiler can include that same header and have a common set of definitions that in turn tie the two together. We only have three interesting variables, the main instance handle for our program and two strings that we're going to dynamically load as resources. The whole point of loading strings from resources rather than just coding them in the C file is so that translators can edit the resource file and the C stays the same for all builds. One string is the window title and the other is the name of the window class. Even though it's unlikely we need this much length, we're allowing for up to max path characters in each, with max path being 260. I'm at a bit of a loss as to why the SDK set the precedent of loading the window class name from the resource file since it's not visible to the user anyway. Now before we actually start coding, I'm going to define some forward references for the functions I'm creating in this file. That allows me to write the code for the functions in any order I see fit so I can lay it out logically rather than just by dependency order. In C, if you want to jump forward to a function you haven't written yet, you have to at least tell the compiler what the function will look like in terms of name and parameters, and that's what we're doing here. And now, our winmain entry point. I'm not going to name it yet, as I actually forget whether it's wwinmain or winmainw for a Unicode app, but it's one of those. Without rat holing too deeply into the Unicode versus ANSI thing, the main thing to remember is that with Unicode, all the characters would be 16 bits instead of 8. The only reason we care is because when winmain accepts the command line as a string for one of its arguments, it needs to know what kind of string is being passed in. I'll define mine as lpwster, the 16-bit kind, and I'll come back with the right name momentarily. The winproc is the most important function and is defined as taking four parameters. The first is going to be the instance handle of the newly launched program, i.e. your own instance handle. The second is the instance handle of the previously running instance of this program, if any. Back in the bad old days before NT's process memory isolation, you could actually use this handle to bootstrap yourself by simply copying data out of the process memory of your previous instance. That's a little dangerous in the real world, so under Win32, this is always just a null handle. It's just a historical oddity today, but you might as well know what it was used for back in the day. The next parameter is the command line. We don't have any use for it in our example code here, but you can imagine you might look for things like a help option or a reset to defaults parameter. Finally, you're given a suggestion from the OS as to how to present your main window, normally minimized or maximized. If you create a shortcut to an app and indicate that you want it to start minimized, this is how the shell tells the application to start up that way.
As soon as our execution begins in WinMain, the first thing our program will do is load its resources. That means it will go and fetch the strings and images and other things defined in the resource file. The simplest example of this is the load string call, where we load the window title and the window class name. Note the W on the end of load string. That means wide, as in wide strings, and anytime you see an API end in capital W, it means the parameters should be wide characters. Load string A is the ANSI version and just load string can conditionally compile either way. I think I'm going to make the executive decision to simplify this program a little bit by inlining the class registration and instance initialization code that I originally planned to break out into separate functions. Let me get rid of these prototypes and I'll just put the code in line for those two. Following our strings, we load our accelerator table, which is how we do our mapping from simple key sequences like control C to actions like copy. With our resources loaded up, there's only one piece missing before we create our window. We need to register a window class, which is where I think the first part of vague mystery starts to enter some programmers' minds. What's happening is we're going to define a type of window. Imagine you're writing a calculator, let's say, and it has three main windows. The main actual window, an equation editor, and a function editor. If the editors are similar enough, then the main window is one class of window and perhaps the editors are another class. The window class describes the things that are common to that type of window, such as the large icon, the small icon, the window procedure code, default background color, and so on. Things like window title aren't included in the class definition because it's assumed each instance of the window would have its own. So really, the class is about what's common to all windows of that type. In our case, we actually only have a single window, so of course there's only going to be one class of window. This might be why this step feels so unnatural to some programmers at first, why register a kind when there's only one in existence, but some programs have many and so that's why we still have to define the class. All we need to do then is to register a window class that describes our single main window. The astute among you may be wondering, well if we define a window class for our main window, why do we not have one for the about box that we're planning? And the simple answer is because the about window is actually a dialog box, which is a special case. Because dialog boxes are so common, Windows registers a window class to be used for them globally across the whole system, so we don't have to do that. Yes, yes, I see it too, but I'll just leave it for a while and come back because I don't want to be jumping all over. Here is where we define the window class, and some of this code could bear a little explanation. You can see that I initialized WCEX to a single value, the size of the structure. The convention for such Windows API structures is that they begin with their size as a crude form of versioning. So this syntax in C will assign the size of value to the first value in the structure and then pad the rest with zeros, which is handy for us. The window style is a bit field where I'm combining the vertical and horizontal redraw flags as my way of asking windows to repaint my surface if the width or the height of my window changes. The window proc is our callback function that will handle any important window messages that are sent to our window. The H instance is akin to the process ID of our process and H icon is the full size icon of the window. The cursor is the default mouse cursor to use when moving over any window of this type. The background brush is a tad weird in that there are a number of special reserved values that you can treat like brush handles. To get the brush for a system color, you actually add one to the color itself and then cast that to be a brush. So what looks like a dirty hack on my part is actually a dirty hack on the system's part that allows you to differentiate between null and false, sort of, and black and no color. Long story short, zero is a null handle but it's also a color index, so they offset the color index by one such that you never have zero as a brush handle.
somehow I got Nano into this weird tagging state where the hacker hunters are at. I'm not sure what I'm doing there, so. Excuse me. Creating a window is a simple affair, but there are quite a few arguments to the API. The first two are simply the window class name and the window title. Then we have the window style, which is overlapped window, which for all intents and purposes you can think of as meaning regular window. It's really a union of a number of values that means the window should have a caption bar, a system menu, a thick frame, minimize and maximize widgets. Next comes the placement and size of the window where CW use default means to place it wherever the OS would like. Then a few null handles where we could optionally pass a custom menu and specify a pair window if we had one. Finally, the instance handle and a handle to any additional data we're attaching to the window, which we're not doing, hence null. If the window cannot be created for some reason, we fail and bail. If all is well, we first show the window to make it visible and then call update window in order to paint it immediately. The nice thing about calling update window is that it bypasses the application's message queue and calls the window procedure directly with a WM paint message, so there's no waiting. By the way, I've spotted a few simple typos that I'll have to fix before this thing will compile, but I'll fix any logic bugs as we go if there are any. Typos like parentheses on register class, I'll just leave alone for now as so as not to distract anyone. This is our message pump. This is the heart of a Windows application. All Windows programs have one. Every time anything of any interest happens, from the mouse moving even by one pixel to a system color preference changing, Windows calls the window procedure function for every window in the entire system with the appropriate messages. This is our code that checks to see if a new message is available by calling get message. If it is, the first thing we see is a call to translate accelerator, and this is about where 90% of Windows programmers copy and paste without really knowing what's going on here. The first thing you need to know is that we have a list of accelerators, or keyboard shortcuts, defined in the resource file. When the user presses the matching accelerator key, it gets translated here into a wm command or wm sys command. That's what the translate message and dispatch message is doing, converting the keystroke into a command. Note that it gets sent to the window passed as the first parameter, not to the original window in the message structure, so you retain control over where they go in case you have multiple windows of the same class but need finer grain control. Now it's time to define our window procedure function that handles the incoming messages. There are only three messages that we're going to worry about. Command messages from our menu items, the paint message that is sent when it's our time to draw our surface, and the destroy message that indicates it's time to tear everything down and exit. That's it. We'll use a simple case statement to break out the messages. Here are the cases for our two simple menu items. For the About menu, we throw up a dialog box with info about the program as per normal. 
If the user selects exit, remember that's just a menu until we actually do something with that and that something is to call destroy window on ourselves. For any other command messages, we just pass them on to def window proc which is the system's default handling for any message. That way, as new messages are added to the system, even if your code doesn't know about them yet, you at least get default behaviors. When I first started writing Windows apps for the very first time in Borland Turbo C++ very long ago, I significantly preferred dialogue based apps because you didn't have to handle WM paint, which I found to be weird and spooky. It turns out that painting is a pretty simple process. First you get a device context which is a handle that you can use for drawing. You get it by calling begin paint with your window handle. Then we want to know how big the window is so we call get client rect. Next we draw some simple text, our hello windows message, centered within that rectangle. Finally, we call end paint to signify that we're done and that's it. The only mystery here is the device context and you should think of that as an opaque handle that we pass to every drawing API while you're doing all of your painting. Behind the scenes, that device context could represent a screen, a printer or even a recorded metafile. But rather than making any assumptions about the size or capabilities, you can ask the system and draw appropriately. This keeps Windows drawing generalized enough that adding printing or screenshots or so on becomes almost trivial because you reuse all of your existing drawing code. The handling of WM destroy is pretty straightforward. We simply post a quit message into our own queue and the default handling for that message will close down the app and stop the message loop. Any messages that we don't otherwise care about or handle are passed on to a system API known as def window proc which performs whatever the default processing the system provides for that message is. If we did handle a message, we return a zero out of the window procedure to indicate that we don't need any further processing on it. Finally, we have the message handler function for the about dialog. This is a slight variation of a standard window procedure known as a dialog proc. This is because dialogs already have a window procedure function. You can modify its behavior by providing your own dialog proc that gets a crack at the message first. The tricky part about dialog box window procedures is that in many cases they need to return two pieces of information, whether or not they handled the message and if so, what the return value for the message actually was. Since in old school C you can only return one value at a time, they opted to return the boolean indicating whether or not the message was handled. I recall odd cases in my career where I actually did need to set what the actual message return value was going to be and here's where having a friend like me from old windows world comes in handy. I'll tell you the secret. You call set window long or set window long pointer with the value you want it to ultimately return and it will dutifully do so. About the only time this matters is for some WM notify cases but you may discover others. It's just like the English language though, not only is Windows fraught with some goofy rules like this, but there are also many exceptions. Certain messages like WMinute dialog can't be overridden and MSDN has the full dirt on which ones are which, if you care. Alright, let's shell out and take a look at our directory. All of the VCX proj files are for the build as is the solution file. You can also see the C++ file, our C resource file and the icon files. The framework.h header isn't actually used anymore, I should delete it as I inlined it into the main program file. To get things started, I'll do a build clean so that we're starting fresh.
I'll kick off the actual build by running MS build alone on the command line and within a second or two we should have a working binary for our Windows app. And sure enough, it's right around 100k and has no dependencies beyond standard system DLLs like user and GDI that are always loaded anyway. To run the program, I'll just copy and paste the name of the output file so that I know I'm getting the exact same one. As you can see, there's some very basic functionality here. We have an about dialog we can check out. We have file exit. Before we exit though, we'll check the horizontal and vertical repainting. Once we know that works, we can pick file exit. If you're wondering just how lean and mean this app is, I made a version that automatically selects exit as soon as it starts, and the round trip from startup to shutdown is 1 400th of a second on my machine. So you can start it up and shut it down 25 times a second. If this is well received, I hope to do retro coding in a number of other areas, from the Commodore 64 and TRS-80 to the PDP-11. So if you're curious about the bare metal basics of apps in a number of languages and on a wide array of platforms, please be sure to take a moment and subscribe to the channel. When I see folks subscribing, I know there's interest in that topic and so I make more like it. And so if you turn on the bell icon, you'll then be notified of them too. It's a win-win situation, but only if you're subscribed. If you liked the episode, please let the algorithm know you're into it by clicking the thumbs up icon and or leaving a comment, which I do in fact read. YouTube really does care about the subs and likes. They call it engagement. I call it dopamine and I'm rather fond of it, so thanks in advance for any subs and likes. Thanks for joining me out here today in the shop. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. You absolutely still could do so, and it would be about the smallest, fattest, fattest. If the window cannot be created for any reason, we fail and bail. If all is whale, <laughs> great.